Jack has already started. <laughs> You're going to like this. This is, um, and it's like I told him, I saved the best for last. And uh, Jack is um, a good friend. He's a great fly fisherman. I learned from him, and um, he's, um, he, has a, uh, he has grandsons who play for BYU. Um, Jackson Emery had did play, and then we got Nick Emery coming up. Yeah, these are these are his grandsons, and um, I'm going to let uh, Jack tell you his story because you're going to um, you're going to like it, and you're going to learn a lot. So, without any further ado, I'm going to turn the time over to Jack Emery. Mm -hmm. I wonder quite a bit why I'm even here. <laughs> I know it's the end of the season, and uh, Rick, I call him Rick, I don't know what you call him. He's getting a little desperate for someone to fill the hour. <laughs> and I have been here, I think, three or four different times. But you know, I don't think we have anything in common. I'm the only one in this room, I'm sure, that remembers Pearl Harbor and the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor. Yeah, I'm that old. <laughs> I was raised in the world with no television, hadn't invented it yet. Certainly no cell phones or computers. There isn't one of you in this room that doesn't have a cell phone, right? Isn't any one of you that doesn't have a computer? I lived in a different world when I was being raised. In fact, very few people ever got to ride a school bus to school. I went to Granite High School and Granite High School farmers, we were farmers, <laughs> way out there in the middle of nowhere. In fact, when we moved out there, my grandmother was very, very upset. She says, you live out there so far that no one will ever come to see you. And it, we were out in the country. I had a barn in my backyard, and between my backyard on 31st South and 27th South was nothing but farm, farm grounds, farm fields. So it was, it was a different world. When you got sick, if you got measles or mumps or whooping cough, they made you put a sign in the window and quarantined you couldn't leave your house. If you left your house, they could be fined or arrested. They used to clean the sidewalks with a wooden plow pulled by a horse. I mean, these are things that I lived with as a young man that you have no concept of. And as I mentioned, the Second World War, the only concept you have of that is you read about it in the history books. So it's a different world we live in. But the principles of success and failure are still the same. It never changed. And today I want to talk about failure. It's my most important subject because everyone experiences it. There isn't anyone sitting here in this room that hasn't failed at something. But that is not the thing to worry about. The thing is, is when we fail, what do we do about it? Think, for example, if you are baseball fans, who is one of the greatest home run hitters of all time? We all come up with the same name. Babe Ruth hit more home runs at his time than any other person. But you know what? He also had the strikeout record. He struck out more than anyone else. If you ever watch a small child learn to walk, how many times do they fall down? Over and over and over again. But they keep getting up, and eventually they learn to walk, and then run, and so forth, and et cetera. That's why I think failure is so important, because it gives us a challenge to get up and do something. Try it. Because we're all going to suffer failure. It's just part of life. But the question is, what do we do about it? I always like interesting quotes. Here's one by Winston Churchill I've always liked. Success is not final. Failure is not fatal. It's the courage to continue that really counts. 
The difference between success and failure is to be able to fall down eight times but get up nine times. The person that keeps getting up is the one that wins. The person who takes a licking and says, okay, that's it, I'm all through, I quit. They're never gonna win. When I owned my business, we had a plaque that had our motto on it, which is simply this. You can't steal second base and keep your foot on first. There's always a risk. There's always a risk. Now, you can stand on first base all day long and that's quite secure. If as long as you're standing on the bag, they're not gonna put you out. But you can't advance. You can't score. You can just stand there and be stagnant. And so, if I were to tell you one thing that I think is important today is that don't be afraid of failure. Be strong, get up, keep moving, and keep moving forward. Because you'll get beat up pretty good in your lifetime. I guarantee some of you'll take some real bad lickings in the business world, in your health, in school, and all of some, a lot of these things are certainly not of your doing. A lot of them happen because of actions of other people. But nevertheless, the key is to get up and keep moving. When I was in college, I took a lot of classes, and I don't, and I, it's been so many years ago, I hardly remember being there. Let's see, I graduated in, out of high school in 1953. <laughs> None of you are alive then. <laughs> Graduated from the University of Utah. It took me seven years. I, I wasn't a very good student in 1960. But in all the classes I attended during that period of time, I remember one teacher and one lecture. And the lecture was this. A fellow by the name of Dean Condry was an attorney. He came up to taught one class at the University of Utah in business law. And his comment was this. Do not get stuck in some place or a position that you're not happy with. Have enough courage to step out and to move about. If you've got a job and you're not going where you think you ought to be going in a reasonable period of time, then go look for something else and keep moving. That really came home to me many years later. I had an uncle that graduated from high school as a young man and went to work for the U.S. Smelling Company in their office. And he stayed there his entire business career. Well, as he got into his early 60s, that company went out of business. My dad called me one day and said, you've got some pretty good contacts. You think you can help your uncle find a job? And I said, well, have him come down. Let's talk to him and see, if maybe I can help out. Here's what was appalling. When he came down, he was in charge of their entire accounting area. He was the boss. He was in charge of the secretaries and the accountants and everyone that worked in that particular area. But when I said, okay, uncle, I need to have him feel for the kind of job you're looking for. How much do they pay you? This will blow you away. $600 a month. He was the lowest paid employee in the whole area. The company took advantage of him. They knew he wasn't going to quit. He'd been there since he was a teenager. Every new secretary they hired was paid more money than that. So don't be stuck with your foot on first base. If you're not happy, if things aren't working the way you think they ought to be, take a risk. Go out and try something a little different. And basically, my whole life has been risking. I've failed more than I have succeeded, many, many times more. But you know, if you get up that next time, it really hurts. I mean, it really helps to keep getting up. So let me tell you a little bit about some of the things you control and some you can't control. I began my business career with one of the finest companies in American history. The company had three letters, IBM. And when I went to work for IBM, I thought I had arrived. Graduated with a degree from the University of Utah, went out into the world, was eventually hired by IBM at $425 a month. That was a lot of money. It's more money than I ever had. I loved IBM. I sat at a desk for six weeks, walked in and quit. They said, why are you quitting? 
I says, because I can't stand sitting at that desk all day long every day. Well, we'd like to keep you. What do you want to know? I said, I don't care. Just get me out on the street because I could see the salesmen coming and going and they were out driving around and calling on customers. And I wanted to be a salesman because they made more money, they drove nice cars, and they didn't have to sit behind a desk all day every day. Well, it took courage to go in and offer to quit before I ever got the offer, so they gave me a job as a salesman. Now, let me tell you about IBM in those days. There weren't any computers. Well, there were great big computers that had filled this room and won't do what your smartphones will do today. We sold punched card systems. You know what punched cards are? Anyone here that doesn't know what a punch card is? I know what it is. <laughs> the machine. You may be the only one. Probably. When you first started with automation, they had a punch card that you'd punch holes into and the machines could read the punch holes. But it only contained 80 columns of information. So the most you could put in there is 80 pieces of information. That was it. Couldn't put 81 or you could do 79 or 80, but you can't do 81. So everything about a customer had to be contained within 80 digits. Now that was a hard sell to sell automation. Let me give you a couple of examples. I was given the responsibility of selling to banks. And so I took a trip one time up through Wyoming and I went into the bank in Rock Springs, Wyoming and met the president of the bank. He looked like he was 200 years old then. <laughs> Big old tall guy and he had a tie on like I have today. He had his hat on, had an Adam, Adam's apple bobbing up and down as he talked. And one of the things I always did when I went to a client, I'd ask him, I'd say, look, how are you doing it now? How are you doing your accounts receivable? How are you doing your payables? How are you doing your pay Whatever. How do you do it now? That would give me some idea of maybe how to attack the situation. Well, this big fellow, I asked him, I says, well, show, tell me how you keep your records now. Do you know how they kept them? Do you know, do you know what a ledger card is? Mm -hmm. They kept them on a ledger card, handwritten. Handwritten. If you wrote a check for $10 and you had $12 in your bank account, they'd write that in there by hand and subtract it. I mean, in today's world, we can't even imagine that. But that's what they did. He had these big, long files of all these dog-eared ledger cards. Everybody in town that had an account there had it all handwritten. He showed me some ledger cards because he had hold them out with great pride of their fine system. To this day, all these many, many years later, I still remember two of the names I saw. One of them was Aunt Maud, and the other one was Zeke. Well, everybody knew who Aunt Maud and Zeke were. What do you think my chances were of selling that guy an 80-column punch card system where he had to give people a number? Mm -hmm. Not going to happen. It's impossible. It wasn't easy to convert people to data processing. It was totally foreign. Down here on 21st South and 3rd West, there's a big caterpillar dealer called Wheeler Machinery. I don't know if you've driven by it, but old man Wheeler, he was tougher than nails. And in sales meeting, they'd say, okay, Kyle, you go see if you can sell Wheeler. And, and Kyle would come back later and say, I can't even talk to the man. They'd say, okay, Melissa, you go sell Wheeler. They won't even give me an interview. So finally, it was my day. And I thought, well, I may not sell him, but I'm gonna talk to him. Out in front of his store, there was an old caterpillar with a big blade on it. This one had cables and everything else to lift the blade. And on there, he typed this model, and I still remember it. It said, you can't do today's work with yesterday's machines if you expect to be in business tomorrow. And I had perfect. <laughs> so I take a picture of that, and then I go into his office. And he has this, there was a secretary sat outside the office, but he was right there, and the secretary was here. And I walked up to the secretary, and I said, is Mr. Wheeler in? And she said, whom so I say is calling? And I spoke real loud and says, it's none of your business, lady. I came to talk to him. I wanted him to hear that. And he said, who's out there? So that was my invitation. I went in. 
<laughs> I went in, I sat down, and he said, what do you want? I gave him that picture, I pushed it across his desk, and I says, now do you really believe that or is that a bunch of BS? And he started to laugh. He said, well, I've seen a lot of salesmen in my life with interesting approaches. He said, but that's the most interesting. Now, who are you? I says, I'm Jack Emery with IBM. He stood up, slapped the disc, and said, get the hell out of here. That was it. That's how hard it was to sell those things. It wasn't easy. I got myself appointed as the data processing consultant for Salt Lake City. A fellow by the name of Jay Bracken Lee was the mayor at the time. He'd been the governor previously in the state of Utah. He was a hard-headed old politician. I told him he had to start thinking about automating. You can't keep doing things by hand forever. He said, well, we don't know anything about it. I says, well, I do. I says, I can help you. Of course, my motive was to sell him the equipment. A few nights later, I was driving home from work, listening to the radio and the news and found out that Jack Emery had just been appointed as the data processing consulting for the city of Salt Lake City. I didn't even know that. <laughs> I learned it on the radio. But I didn't stay long enough to fulfill that obligation because I came to the realization that I was not a big corporate man because I'm not saying anything against big corporations and some of you may end up in big corporations. But the problem is the cul corporate culture Sometimes it's very, very difficult to deal with. For example, when you work for IBM, can't wear a shirt like this. White shirts, had to be a striped tie, still have striped ties. You were told how to dress, how to behave. Even the guys that worked on the equipment, which in those days, a lot of it was run by hydraulics, but oil and dirt, they still had to wear a suit, white shirt, white shirt and a tie. <coughs> That was the corporate culture. But the thing that eventually chased me off is their sales plan. They always had prided themselves they never fired anyone. <coughs> but they could get rid of you real easy. <laughs> Let me tell you about a sales plan in a big corporation. When I went to work for IBM, I used to get $2 for every point. And here's how they calculated the point. If I leased a machine for $1,000 a month, I got 1,000 points. And so I made $2,000 on that deal. At least for $300 a month, I got 300 points, made $600 on that deal. And it was commission only. You didn't get a salary, you had to sell. When I left IBM six years later, I got 20 cents a point. Because they can just keep cutting, cutting, and changing and changing. That's very common in corporate America, in the marketing. They keep changing things to their advantage. But here's where it really got bad. Melissa, you just sold a big deal. You made $5,000 on it. Pretty good? You like that? I'm okay with that. Then that thing had to stay in there because if you ever, if it ever came out, guess what? You had to give the $5,000 back. Oh, you can't have my money. So that was the, that was the sales plan. You get it in there, that machine in there, but don't you ever let it come out, because if it comes out, you gotta pay us back. Now let me tell you the dirty tricks that can go on. Guess what, Joy? I kinda like you, and I'm the manager. And I'm gonna protect you. You got a deal that you made $5,000 on, it's getting ready to come out, and you know it's coming out. You come to me and say, hey, I can't keep that in there. I say, don't worry, I'll take care of it. So I say to Melissa, guess what, Melissa, I'm going to give you that account now. So that's your account. Guess what, when it comes out, she gets charged back with it. I mean, these are some of the things that go on in big corporations. So don't be surprised if you get into a corporate environment and find some things that are very surprising because they are there. They literally are there. And, and I don't mean this to demean IBM or any other company for that matter. It's just the real world we live in. It's just the real world we live in. <coughs> Big corporations are there for one reason. That's to make money for themselves and their stockholders. And employees are expendable. Of all the guys I started to work with at IBM, I don't know any of them 
that stayed there and retired, not one. They used to have what they called a 100% club. If you, each year you were given a quota to sell, and if you sold your quota, you were treated to a nice trip. They'd get together and all the good sales went throughout the country. I mean, they put on a nice big trip for you. But I'd go to these things, and you know what? I used to say to myself, where are the old guys? There weren't any. You never saw any, but it was at least 35 years old. They were all young guys. Because the corporate culture was, you work the heck out of those young guys, and when they get tired, get rid of them and go get some more. And that, that's common in the world. I'm not saying don't work for a big corporation. I'm just saying don't be surprised when you hear those kind of things. So I left IBM. I didn't know what to do. Did I fail? Yeah, maybe I did, but I learned something. Every time I've failed in life, I've learned something that I can use to protect myself later on. I left IBM and thought I'd try selling insurance. I wasn't any good at that. I didn't even like to tell people I was an insurance salesman. I thought it was something a little less than what I thought I ought to have. So I didn't last very long of that. I left that and became a stockbroker. My timing was impeccable. In 1969, the market went and I went with it because it was a straight commission job. Right? You didn't do trades. You were paid a commission on the amount of trades you did, buying and selling for your customers. I couldn't do any trades. No one was doing anything in the market besides getting beat to death. In fact, one day I said to myself, okay, I'm gonna go to work today and anybody that's got any stock in a profit position, I'm gonna call them and suggest they sell it and take their profit. So I opened my books and looked over all my customers. I couldn't find one customer with one stock in a profit position. You can't make any money if you can't sell. So I quit being a stockbroker. Did I fail? Well, yeah, in a way I did, but I learned something. My brother and I decided to start our own company. He'd been a stockbroker also. We thought we could develop real estate. We built a project that we thought was really wonderful. At the time today, it's become a slum. <laughs> That's been a lot of years ago. And we were gonna make a lot of money. But you know what happened? Here's again things that happened outside of your control. We had a bank loan to build the project. We had architects that drew up the plans. We had the property, we had everything in place to have this wonderful project that was gonna make all this money. We put it out to bid, we let the bids out and everything else. And then we started to build and the city inspectors came by and says, hey, you're too close to the property line. You can't build here. When we first had those documents or the uh, plans made up, they wrote in hand across the plains, hold back the average of the area. That's hold back from the street. In other words, you can't build a house right on the edge of the street. There's generally a, a hold back area that you have to stay so far away from it. In this particular part of town, it was very close to the street, so they said hold back the average, which we did. But you know what? The city changed their mind. They made us come in and tear all the footings out, come up with new plans, have to redesign the whole darn thing so they could move it back 10 feet. You don't expect things like that, but it happens. The next little problem was kind of fun. Those were the years when the prime interest rate went out of sight. Our bank loan was prime plus so many points. Prime was low when we started, but prime went to 18%. You can't survive if you're building your whole structure on a 6% loan and all of a sudden it's 18%. Not only that, we had all kinds of trouble with the unions. There was a billboard on the property, and one day we, they, they left it up while we were constructing because we put a big sign up telling the world what we were doing. So one day the billboard people came in to take it down because we're getting close to completion. Guess what? All the other workers walked off the job because these weren't union guys. I didn't know you could have so much trouble with the unions. 
we were getting really close, and I was pushing like mad to finish because this 18% interest, interest was killing us. Walked in there as a carpenter sitting down. About three o'clock in the afternoon. I says, don't you have something to do? He said, well, I've, I've already driven my quota of nails for the day. By then, they didn't have the automatic pneumatic hammers, and you had to drive every nail with a hammer. He had a quota of nails. He could only drive so many nails a day. I said, you gotta be kidding. Oh no, I didn't know that. Couldn't drive the nails. They finally, the janitors went on strike and so they all walked off the job. So I walked up to the contract and fired him. So I said, you're out of here. And I went and hired new people to finish the project. But with the unions, the interest rates, the trouble with the city, that project went belly up and the banks had to repossess it. Did I do anything wrong? I didn't think I did. But, but I was the beneficiary of a lot of changes that took place. So just because you're out trying to do something doesn't necessarily mean you're gonna be without problems. And problems that you can't even foresee. These things happen in life. After I started my company, after a short period of time, my brother and I, once we got through that little fiasco, started buying and selling used IBM equipment because we knew IBM equipment. He'd worked for IBM also. And I knew what I could buy machines for in the marketplace, and so we'd always sell before we'd buy. So I'm gonna sell you a new printer and it'll be $15,000, but I knew I could buy one for 12. I never had any inventory and I thought that was neat, didn't have to have any money tied up. And generally speaking, I did just fine on that. But the problem was, people were accustomed to renting or leasing from IBM. Very few people bought equipment in those days. They didn't want to know how much, they wanted to know how much per month. I didn't know a thing about leasing, but I had to teach myself. And so we now went off in a different direction, trying to teach ourselves how to do leasing. And that's what the company ended up being, is a big leasing company. When we left, uh, 1998 is when I sold it. We were doing about $100 million a year, which by national standards is still pretty small, but by my standards, I thought we were pretty good. So we had to teach ourselves the leasing business. And that was painful too, because I didn't want to admit I didn't know what I was doing. <laughs> but I had to get the books out, had to read about it, had to ask people about it. They're out there in the marketplace every day telling people I knew what I was doing when I really didn't. But I had enough guts to do it. But here's the most interesting story. I got a call one day from an airline, Air Transat, out of Montreal, Canada. And they said, I understand you're in the leasing business. I said, yes, uh, I am. Well, we want to lease two big jumbo jetliners, L-1011s. Can you do that for us? Of course we can do that for you. I didn't know anything about leasing airplanes. Of course, I told them, yeah, we can do that. And believe it or not, we worked it through and got the deal. That was a big deal because the payments had two airplanes were a quarter of a million dollars a month each, and then what they call the reserves for maintenance was another quarter of a million dollars a month. So the total bill those people were putting out is a million dollars a month. And guess who signed on the line for the loans? Well, everything went fine until a few years ago, if you look at your history, there's a little thing called Desert Shield that came along, which was the precursor to Desert Storm and the war in, in Iraq. Well, when Desert Shield came along, the price of fuel did what? They had sold everything out in advance but now all the money that they intended to make as a profit all had to be used for fuel. And you know what? Then we had Desert Storm on top of that and then nobody wanted to fly. They were afraid to fly. And now guess what? They quit paying the bills. And so what did the bank do? They came to me and says, million dollars a month. 
I said, shoot, <laughs> because if, there's no way I can cover a million dollars a month. To this day, I'm not sure how we got out of that. It went on and on and on for years. But we finally did come out of it and actually made a profit. But it was sure a lot of pain. But here again, who would think that something that happened in Iraq would affect me in Salt Lake City? Didn't make any sense. Was it a failure? Well, yes and no. Did I learn something? I learned a whole bunch. You better prepare. One kind of fun story in the airline business, I started chasing airline leases once I learned a little bit about it. I was working on a deal with Olympic Airlines out of Athens, Greece. It was a pseudo commercial slash government operation. Government owned, I think, half the stock or more. I don't remember exactly. But the government really controlled it, even though it was a commercial venture. And I proposed to them to do a sale leaseback on all of their equipment. So I was going to go in and buy it all, pay them cash, and then lease it back to them. I used that quite extensively in my business, and I won't take the time to tell you how it worked, but it worked very well. But I spent <clears throat> two or three times flying back and forth to Greece trying to put this deal together, and it was going to be a $150 million deal. Now, every salesman dreams about doing a $150 million deal, and it looks like it was going to go. And on one occasion, here's the fun part, they'd fly me back and forth on their airplanes out of New York. I had to get to New York, but from New York on, I was their guest on a 747. 747, if you've ever been on one, has kind of an upper deck. That was their first class section, and I always flew first class up there. They treated me really nice. And one time coming back from Greece, I was the only passenger up there. And the captain came back to rest a little bit. The co-pilot was still up there, and he and I struck up a conversation, and I told him I was a private pilot and had lots of hours in the air. And he said, why don't you go up and sit in the left seat? He says, I'll stay back here and watch the movie. <laughs> So I went up and sat in the left seat of that 747 all the way across the Pacific. When I got back, I entered it in my logbook. Pilot in command, left seat of a 747. That's kind of a side story. But anyway, this deal was ready to come down. They said, okay, come on over, we're ready to sign the documents. So I flew back to Greece, and I was told I would be met at the airport by a man whom they identified as a peddler of influence. I don't know what that meant. <laughs> but it didn't sound right. <laughs> this fellow met at the airport, met me at the airport, and took me to the palace. They have a palace where the president, Papandreou was president at the time. But coincidentally, on that very same day, the, uh, oh, come on. The king of, I've lost it, Turkey or one of those mid-eastern country was making a, a state visit there and they had a big parade in his honor. And uh, anyway, the streets were lined with spectators and they had the barriers up to keep people away from the street. I don't know who this peddler of influence was, but as we approached these areas, the police had just moved people aside. He didn't have to say a word to them, so they knew who he was. And we moved aside and went right into the palace. Sat in a great big room. On, I was on one end with the peddler of influence, and on the other end was the entourage for the, I didn't think I'd ever forget who that was. Anyway, it's not important. They were important people. That's them. <laughs> so anyway, I had an appointment with the Minister of Finance and the Minister of Transportation. We met first with the Minister of Finance and he says, well, let's review this one more time because we're ready to move ahead on it. All right. So I reviewed it quickly, verbally, and he says, well, fine. He says, I'm ready to sign, but I have just one thing that I need. And I says, what's that? He says, well, we'll need a small contribution to our political party because we need those dollars to stay in power. I says, well, what do you consider a small contribution? He said, oh, not much. He said, just a million dollars will do. I says, in my country, you can go to jail for paying off bribes. Oh, no, it's not a bribe. It's just a, a contribution. I didn't expect that. 
But then the peddler of influence told me that's exactly how they do business there. Well, I spent all that time running back and forth and didn't know I was going to have to pay a bribe to get the business. And then I was supposed to meet with the Minister of Transportation the next day. And I said to the pedal of influence, I said, I'm not going to, I said, is he going to ask for money too? And he said, oh yes, he'll want another million. I said, there isn't that much profit in this deal. There really was, but I was lying a little bit. <laughs> and he said, oh, don't worry about it. He says, we'll just adjust the numbers and add it on top. And then once you fund it, you can just pass the money back. Well, I said, I'm not going to meet with the Minister of Transportation tomorrow. <laughs> He said, oh, you can't stand him. I'm this cabinet-level officer in the government of Greece. He said, I'll pick you up at the hotel at 9 in the morning. Well, as soon as he was gone, I caught a cab, went to the airport, and flew home. <laughs> all that deal I'd worked on so hard over all those many months went down the drain. Why? Because I wasn't aware of the fact that you had to do bribes to do business in that particular country. I guess maybe that's why they're broke today and not doing well. Surprises, yeah, they're surprises. They happen all the time. How do we make our money? We started our company by accident. My brother and I both worked for an outfit in, in uh, Phoenix. We worked as commission paid salesmen, got 30% of the net profit of any transaction. Everything went fine until I did a deal with Coca-Cola with, had a half a million dollars net profit in it. I see 30 minutes, 30 times a half a million. <laughs> As I figure that out, that's 150 grand we just made in commissions. I was pretty happy. But then the boss says, I'm not gonna pay you that much. You didn't work that hard on this deal. I says, that's true. I close it in about three weeks. Doesn't matter. My contract says 30%. Well, I'm not gonna give it to you. He couldn't stand to pay out $150,000. So my brother and I walked out the door, started our own company. You know how much money we had to, as paid in capital between the two of us? 800 bucks. <laughs> but most people when they start companies have a business plan and they analyze this and they analyze that. They arrange for bank fines, they have all these things. All we did is walk out the door and say, we only know how to do one thing. So we went and got us an office, got us a telephone, couldn't afford any furniture, so we sat on the floor and made telephone calls, willing to steal second base to get off first. Well, that was the beginning of my company that I eventually sold for a very nice profit many years ago. You just don't know. My dad always told me that life was not a spectator sport. He says, if you wish to succeed in life and if you wish to be happy, don't sit by and watch the other people do it. Get in the game, do things. Life is not a spectator sport. Don't sit and watch. Get in the game. Well, I've always believed that was a great way to do things. And don't be afraid, just go do it. The biggest impediment to success in this world is fear. What will they think of me if I try and fail? That'll kill you. That absolutely will kill you. You've got to be willing to take risks. You've got to be willing to take criticism. You've got to be able to take some laughter maybe. People are laughing at you. But you know something? I got laughed at a lot. I got criticized a lot. But in the end, I came out on top. And for one reason and one reason only, that I was willing to keep moving forward. Well, I could tell you lots of interesting stories because I've had many of them over many, many years. But that's not the point. The point is, I'm not here as a professional. I'm not an attorney. I'm not an engineer. I'm not a doctor. I'm not a, a big retail giant man. I was a salesman. I'll tell you one final little story that's kind of fun. When my youngest daughter was in kindergarten, her teacher called home one night, and she says, I've got to tell you what your daughter said today in school. I thought, oh, brother, what family secrets are out on the table? 
She said, I ask each of the children to stand up and tell where their daddies worked. Well, one of them would stand up and say, well, my daddy's a doctor, he works at the hospital. Another one would stand up and say, well, my daddy's a, a lawyer, he works here. Or my daddy works at Kennecott, he's a minor. He says, she said, when it was your daughter's turn to stand up, she says, my daddy doesn't work, he just talks. <laughs> <laughs> but I made a good living to just talking and have enough guts to keep trying to steal second base. No matter how many times we got thrown out, kept trying. Well, I appreciate the opportunity to come here today and to visit with you. I, okay. This was from a, uh, a talk given by Theodore Roosevelt in Paris. And I have a copy of this one, a little teeny card that I put in my wallet over 40 years ago, and it's been with me ever since. But here's what Theodore Roosevelt said. It's not the critic who counts, not the man who points out how the strong man stumbles or where the doer of deeds could have done them better. The credit belongs to the man who is actually in the arena, whose face is marred by dust and sweat and blood, who strives valiantly, who errs and comes up short again and again because there is no effort without error and shortcoming. But, to, who, but who does actually strive to do the deeds who knows the great enthusiasms, the great devotions, who spends himself in a worthy cause, who at best knows in the end the triumph of high achievement, and who at the worst, if he fails, at least fails while daring greatly, so that his place shall never be with those cold and timid souls who know neither victory nor defeat. I've loved that. But anyway, thank you very much for entertaining me for a while. Who in here is a salesman? Raise your hand. If you haven't raised your hand, get it up. <laughs> because no matter what profession you go into, you are going to be a salesman. Jack is way modest when he said just a salesman. And um, I, uh, I appreciate those words and that uh, uh, let's thank uh, Jack Emery. Thank you. Thank you, Jack. Thank you. I came because he promised to take me to lunch afterwards. <laughs> there, there is such a thing as free lunch. <laughs> thank you.